So here we go. I'm uh, Dr. Roland Kent again. I'm here with Dr. Jared Cook. And again, I want to thank the Seattle Science Foundation for this opportunity. Apropos of the discussion we just had in which we're looking at augmentation of the iliac fixation uh, and SI joint fixation, we want to kind of explain how we do these in a practical sense. I was here last year and had the opportunity to demonstrate bedrock with uh, intraoperative fluoroscopy. This year, we're kind of ratcheting it up a notch, and I want to thank uh, Medtronic for coming and supplying O-Arm and Stealth for us, and then also want to thank SI Bone for coming and uh, bringing some of these exciting new implants that we have the opportunity to demonstrate. And so this is not dissimilar to the discussion that we had last year. Anyone who's familiar with an S2 ALAR iliac trajectory screw is not going to have a tremendous amount of problems in putting in uh, one of the granite devices or even the bedrock device, as the trajectory is very similar to what we would see with S2 ALAR iliac trajectory screws. The major difference, as I demonstrated on one of our slides and as we've talked about previously, is making sure that you have enough bony real estate to receive the implants that we're placing within the pelvis. And to that end, when we're looking specifically at our teardrop image, with our more distal fixation, we want to make sure that we're in the lower one-third of the teardrop so that we reserve enough room for the supplementary fixation above that. And so today we're going to demonstrate a stacked granite, meaning two screws that have a tulip head. And I can go ahead and demonstrate this screw. It's a 3D printed titanium screw that facil facilitates both bony on-growth and bony in-growth, but is interesting also in that it has harvesting ports at the uh, leading edge of the screw in that as we're advancing it across the sacrum into the ilium, it's harvesting that bone that then will fill the screw and supply the bony through growth, which also occurs to affect the sacroiliac joint fusion, along with increasing the rigidity of the distal end of our construct, hopefully preventing construct failure. And so this device is placed very similar to the way that we'd place a traditional S2 ALR iliac screw with that one exception in the sense that we're trying to maintain as much real estate as we possibly can. These uh, processes are made quite a bit easier with the utilization of intraoperative navigation, whether that be freehand navigation or robotic assistance, and I've used both of those in this case. Um, but this is also a procedure that can very easily be done with intraoperative fluoroscopy by those who are familiar with S2 ALAR iliac trajectory screws. Um, I would tell you that at the beginning of my sort of career placing these and stacking these devices, I was using primarily intraoperative fluoroscopy, and it wasn't until later that we began adopting enabling technologies to help us do this. So uh, if you're one of the majority of spine surgeons out there that doesn't have access to these technologies, it does not prevent you from doing this. Uh, if you wanted to reference the talk that we gave last year in which we used the intraoperative fluoroscopy, that walks you through all the tricks and the tips associated with that modality. Today we're going to be using O-Arm and Stealth to demonstrate a similar S2 ALR iliac trajectory while stacking it with the granite device. And then after we do that, we'll discuss just quickly some of the other devices available uh, that affect this fusion and stability across the SI joint. So I'm going to start. We have all of our... Uh, just standard tools uh, with reference arrays so that we're able to use them with the stealth technology. Um, the important point, I'm going to start with the more distal screw, and one of the things that I'd sort of just point out when we're using intraoperative navigation, whether, whether it be freehand or whether it be robotic assisted, is you want to pay close attention to where you're putting your reference arrays because it's not uncommon that you can disrupt the line of sight between your infrared camera and the reference array if you place that reference array in the long, wrong spot. And if you actually see our setup on our cadaver today, I'm not sure if we're able to see this, but we have our reference array associated with one of the spinous processes, and it is proximal to where I'll be working. So we have the pelvis down here, we have the shoulders up this direction, our infrared camera is coming in from the head and is looking at a reference array that's mounted on the spinous process proximal to where we, we will be working in the pelvis. And that's a, a nice setup for this in the sense that if I had pelvic-based reference arrays, my chance of disrupting those pelvic 
uh, based reference arrays is higher as I begin doing these S2 ALAR iliac trajectory screws. So it's important to take that into account with your surgical planning right from the get-go so that you're not running into your reference arrays and making this more complicated than it needs to be. If you're doing a standard open scoliosis uh, reconstruction, it becomes reasonably easy then to add your reference array to that spinous process through that open wound and then be able to utilize the navigation uh, to deliver the most uh, safe trajectory possible uh, with these particular screws. But so my starting point traditionally for an S2 ALAR iliac screw is going to be taking advantage of the sacral ala between the S1 and the S2 neural foramen. If I'm doing this with normal radiography or intraoperative fluoroscopy, I'm going to look at an outlet view of the sacrum, and I'm going to place my, uh, uh, my gear shift right between the S1 and the S2 neural foramina as a starting point, trying to engage as much of the sacrum as I possibly can. If we're able to reference our imaging here, you can see that I'm essentially reproducing this with our intraoperative navigation. And there's a couple things that I want to bring your attention. If we look at the upper left-hand screen first, that's an axial representation of this particular patient. And my considerations in the axial representation are one, my starting point. I'm trying to engage as much of the sacrum as I possibly can. Two, my crossing across the SI joint, in which I try to be as anterior or as ventral as possible to engage that more anterior cortex of the SI joint. If then we move to the right upper image, we can actually visualize the sacral notch, and that's one of the things that I told us, excuse me, the sciatic notch, that we're trying to avoid. If I aim too far south, I can end up being directly in that sciatic notch, which can be devastating for the patient and damage some of those important structures. If I look at my bottom left uh, projection, again, I'm able to reference the fact that I'm just above the sciatic notch. And then if I look at my lower right projection, that's an illustration of the radiographic teardrop. And again, I'm aiming for that distal portion of the screw to be in the lower one third of the teardrop. And I can affect that. I can place it too high. I can place it too low. Or we can get it right to that sweet spot. So I'm trying to reference each of these images as I'm driving my uh, gear shift across uh, the starting point, across the SI joint itself. This cadaver has a uh, pretty uh, non-dense bone. Uh, typically, this is something that I'll get a starting point just with a mallet. In this particular cadaver, it's, it's reasonably easy to just advance by hand. I believe that our control, especially in dense bone, is much, much better with the mallet. So uh, traditionally, if I'm using a gear shift that's navigated, I'm going to go ahead and just gently tap it forward as I'm coming to the yellow that we see in the navigation is, is the projected uh, trajectory of the screw, whereas the, the blue is the actual instrument itself. So I'm now within the sacrum at that starting point in the S2 ala, advancing towards the SI joint itself. And I'm going to try to maintain that trajectory that I explained in each of these different projections. And right here, I've actually hit the SI joint. And I'm going to go ahead and use a mallet if we have it. We're going to use a field expedient mallet, which is our uh, cob. And again, I'm making sure that I'm superior to the, the sciatic notch. I'm as far ventral in the SI joint as this uh, approach will allow me. And uh, I'm also aiming towards the, the meat or the cortical segment of the ilium, which is going to be just above the acetabulum. And we'll go ahead and advance that across the SI joint. And once we get into the iliac bone, uh, typically it's quite a bit less dense, and we're able to advance quite easily and readily. Uh, into that iliac bone. So you want to be careful that you don't accidentally plunge too deeply within that bone. You can see with my current trajectory, I may engage the outer cortex of that ilium. I'm actually reasonably happy with that, even with an S2 ALAR iliac trajectory screw, because then I'm involving another cortex in strengthening that fixation. And so once I've established the track, I'm going to go ahead and remove that. You could either put a guide wire down and do a lot of this through that guide wire afterwards. In this case, I'm just going to go to a tap. And with this granite system, there's actually a sequential tap system of which you have both cannulated and non-cannulated taps available. And again, I'm going to follow that same trajectory and just let the tap advance itself. In these cases, as I'm using navigation, I like to have as little pressure pushing forward on the tap as possible and let the cutting flutes of the tap do all the work. 
The more pressure you put on this, the more likely you are to fracture that posterior aspect of the sacrum, and the more likely you are to also guide it in a direction uh, that, that is uh, less advantageous and causes scythe as you're coming across that. So as little pressure as I possibly can while advancing and allowing the cutting flutes to do the work. Roland, Roland, this yes, is Jens. So question about tapping. Um, somebody speaking from this microphone many, many moons ago wrote an oft-quoted paper about the ill effects of tapping. A weakening actual bone pullout. Why do you tap? And that was by, reinforced by Dr. David Skaggs, who says tapping is unnecessary in a larger clinical paper on pediatric patients. Why do you need to tap? Right. I think that's an excellent question. And I uh, actually, with pedicle screw placement, et cetera, I wholeheartedly agree. I try to avoid tapping uh, the pedicles. Uh, in this case, the, the major reason is, is that we're actually crossing joints. It's far different than the pullout strength associated with a pedicle screw. We have so many cortical interfaces here that uh, I would be concerned, unless the screw itself, which this is a reasonably aggressive screw with uh, good cutting flutes, et cetera, but unless the screw was aggressive enough to make it across these cortical surfaces, uh, you're more likely to have scythe of that device, especially within the SI joint. And maybe if I could drop this back down. The scythe that I get concerned about is right here. You can see where the tip of my gear shift is. And if I don't tap across that SI joint, often that near cortex of the ilium can divert my screw and I can end up way too medial. And so I've found in tapping at least across the SI joint that we improve the safety of the procedure so that it doesn't scythe without our knowledge. Fair enough. That invites my next question, the safety aspect. Cannulated devices, K-wires, those K-wires sometimes have this really bad habit of uh, moving out of place or shearing off. Your thoughts? Yeah, obviously that's made less complicated by uh, navigation because you're able to follow those same trajectories time and time again. My thoughts there are very similar to what I just described. I think most of the time when we shear off K-wires, it's because we fail to follow the trajectory and we fail to follow the trajectory because we are working too hard as surgeons. Um, I, I spend a lot of time kind of teaching these techniques to, to surgeons and I, I always bristle at the surgeon that I see immediately coming in and trying to get as much pressure into that device as possible. I would much prefer someone to walk in and put that implant over a guide wire and simply just use the two fingers to advance that. And uh, that reduces the surgeon's inability to follow the direction of the guide wire, reduces the likelihood of sky, then reduces the likelihood of shearing that guide wire. This is, again, a graduated tap, so in this case, it, it depends, uh, again, on how you feel the quality of bone. Oh. Yeah, we're getting a little bit of bounce here with the navigation, I apologize. But again, and trying to end up in that lower one-third of the teardrop, steering across the SI joint. This is, again, just the next size up tap. And then we're going to go ahead and put the final device. And uh, everyone's going to have a different approach to the number of taps they use. It's largely dependent on the bone. The graduated tap system, meaning starting with a small tap and then ending with a larger tap, I think presents the possibility, especially over a K-wire, of, of some of those complications that Dr. Chapman was just addressing. Um, so in someone with amenable bone, I believe that fewer passes are probably more helpful. Um, and so I have a tendency in most of my patients to use a single tap just across the SI joint and then otherwise advancing um, the uh, final uh, implant. And again, that has everything to do with pullout strength, has everything to do with safety, and uh, my desire to, uh, to optimize the, uh, the procedure for the patient with putting them at the, the least amount of risk. Hey, one more question, Roland. How good is your proprioceptive torque feedback with a tap in the uh, actual ilium? Do you feel you're in bone, or if you were to penetrate, uh, is that just uh, not perceptible for you? No, typically you can feel you're in bone. And so when you're using the navigation, I tell folks that um, an important part of checking you know, doing anatomy checks while you're using intraoperative navigation is confirming that what you see on the screen is what you would normally feel um, biofeedback-wise 
from where you're at within the joint. And so every time you engage the SI joint, for example, you're gonna get quite a bit more pressure against the tap, you'll get quite a bit more pressure against the final implant. And if I am driving an implant in and I think I'm hitting that SI joint and I'm not feeling that extra pressure, I'm gonna be immediately skeptical of what I'm seeing from a navigation standpoint. And in those cases, I have a low threshold to move fluoro in and verify that I'm exactly where I think I'm at. So we'll finish driving this in. Again, this is a favored angle head. The head is easily rotated, so once I've brought the screw all the way down to the cortex, then I can go ahead and back this off. I hope in looking at my uh, demonstration here that I've saved enough real estate here for Jared to uh, put the uh, device up above, we'll see. Um, it is okay, actually, for those devices uh, to uh, uh, sort of come together, so as long as the starting point is separate, now I'm gonna have Jared come on in. The starting point for this more proximal device is gonna be just lateral to the S1 neural foramen. And again, what we're trying to do is maximize the amount of sacral bone that we include in the passage of this particular device. And uh, again, staying appropriately proximal to the sciatic notch. And you can see in this case, it appears that they're gonna be convergent, that is fine. Um, I actually, a lot of times, will use the driver from the first S2 alar iliac trajectory screw that I put in to be a reference to how I'm going to then bring this more proximal device in. However, the start point for that more proximal device being just lateral to the S1 neural foramen uh, sort of necessitates a steeper approach, um, meaning more, uh, more posterior to anterior than our first device, which is in that S2 alar bone. And we can see Jared advancing here. He's all the way up to the SI joint, proximal to our device. I, if you look at the lower right-hand screen, he's aiming perfectly for the upper one-third of the teardrop. And if you need, you can tap across. And again, so already we're getting this same anatomy check that I referenced. He's getting quite a bit of feedback from the SI joint as he engages first the near cortex of the sacrum and then the far cortex of the ilium and it lines up exactly with what we're seeing with our intraoperative uh, navigation. And so we're fairly happy in this regard that we have a reasonable uh, anatomy check. I think you may be convergent enough with my screw that they're hitting. And so what we're gonna do is just change the, just have you aim uphill a little bit more. Is that in the array? There you yeah, go. Right, yeah, I like that. And so we'll just change the trajectory. He just began engaging with that gear shift into the screw that I already placed. I gave him the much harder job and uh, having to go after and uh, it's still some mm -hmm. of his real estate, so it makes it that much more difficult. He really wants to go in that same hole too. Let, let me ask, um, yes. wait, Dr. Pimenta, how smart is it to take, put all this big hardware into the ilium. I heard this word, yeah. limited real estate. That raises a red flag for me. Is it a good idea to put all this metal into this pelvis and then have a problem later in case of failure of having basically not even Swiss cheese left? Are we creating an unreconstructable lumbopelvic junction? I'm not sure where uh, that's ending up. Michael, here. Uh, well, uh, <laughs> My, my uh, understanding on the need of yeah, exactly. supplementation, posture, surgery work, we just heard, heard the importance of combining anterior and posture to have the best, of the be uh, the best result of both worlds. Uh, I think is very good to have that much Posture support. Yeah, I think that's perfect. But probably we would reduce the amount of need so much metal posture if we combine better anterior and posture work. And one thing that we are working now with EOs is trying to understand with EOs, and these will need some years, of course. Uh, on uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning, if do doing combined anterior-posterior work, we may reduce the need 
of too much posture metal with the same yeah, good, maybe less complications. I think that's an important point. Okay, what else do you have left to do here, like Roland and... We're adding our more proximal screw right now, and again, I consider this sort of a counter-rotation screw. This is another one in which we have the tulip head associated with it so that it can be incorporated into our construct. We're going to go ahead and let Jared put that down, and just quickly, I want to just demonstrate a couple of other options. Hey, is this screw out immediately? I mean, this looks like the, your trajectories look like they're, I don't know where, but not in the pelvis. Is that an artifact? So you're able to move this around and fool yourself when doing that. Are you fooling yourself or me or the audience? <laughs> who, who's who's yeah, getting okay. fooled here? Is that a virtual reality gag? So it just depends on where he had actually dropped the, the final screw. I mean, you'd want to verify all of this with your intraoperative fluoroscopy. But that's a virtual representation of uh, the angle of the insertion device at the time that it was captured. And so, uh, you know, I, I, again, depend a lot more on the feedback that I'm getting from the patient, et cetera. Um, but I do pay attention, obviously, to the navigation. And I think in this case, it's a, an artifact that I don't think we're really that medial with the device. I can line up the driver with it afterwards and demonstrate. <laughs> But some of these other options, as he's putting that down, is one, uh, what we're using on the Sylvia study, which is, again, the 3D printed triangular device. This is put in in much the same way that Jared is currently putting in this granite device, only you're going to do this over a guide wire. So in this case, I'd use my gear shift. I'll place my guide wire. I will traditionally drill over that guide wire and then use a brooch, which is triangular shaped, across the SI joint, and then place this in with an impaction device. The other alternative is, an, is a 3D printed headless titanium screw, similar in nature to the granite. However, it will not be incorporated in your construct. And I actually like the utilization of this device just because I don't have to work to get my rod contoured appropriately, so it has to fit into both of those two lip heads. Can you comment on the use of power versus the hand? on the collateral movement and the maybe breaking screws and uh, skiving, et cetera. Yeah, agree. I mean, I think back to that entire concept that a reasonably high speed with low pressure against the device itself is helpful. Power can provide that speed without us having to provide the muscle to push against that device. So when I utilize power in these, these instances, again, the concept of allowing, especially if it's over a guide wire, allowing the power to drive that device without me necessarily steering it or pushing it is uh, instrumental. And then also, uh, many people, and it depends on what your comfort zone is, but there are a number of surgeons that feel more comfortable utilizing the power um, and, and getting that feedback from bouncing off cortices, et cetera, and steering that screw into place. And I would uh, kind of counsel any surgeon who's uh, starting this anew is to use the uh, workflow that works best with you, where you feel that you get the most feedback from the bone to be as safe as possible. Once you feel comfortable doing that, adopting new strategies, uh, such as using power or not using power, but agree the ability to inject uh, sort of a wrong trajectory is probably higher as we're driving this in ourselves, especially as we're adding our muscle to that. But even with power, you can do it as long as if you're pushing too hard. Hey, one more question. We have Dr. Schaffer here. Yep. And I want to ask him the TMM question. We all know TMI, too much information. And maybe those images up there show us TMI, but TMM, too much metal. So is there a problem with too much metal? I asked Lewis about that, and he gave some biologic answers. I'm concerned about this. And we had a great Tuesday evening case discussion from Maryland showing salvages in case of failures of these massive metal lumbopelvic fixations. So please talk about merits of too much metal versus uh, kind of avoiding a failure in the first place. So I think there's several things with the metal. And I had a lady that had come to my, a lady that had come to my clinic that I had done a very big reconstruction on. And about a year and a half after she did it, she started developing like eczema all over her body. So she went to a, she went to a uh, allergist who did a bunch of testing and her like her chromium levels 
were really, really high. Okay. And he thought it was due to chromium. And this is a person where I had, you know, done like a T3 to iliac with third and fourth rods and a kickstand rod and, you know, four or five iliac screws. And suddenly, you know, with again, with cobalt chrome rods, you know, I think there's always a little fretting and a little bit of wear debris and different things going on. So I do think from a metal perspective, that's a concern. I think it's a little less with titanium. Now, one of the issues is with these, with these, uh, with these, you know, either with the the original uh, bedrock or the granite, you know, they they've got ex really extensive, you know, porous surfaces, which again has the interaction to do it. They are predominantly, or, or they're, I think they're 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 titanium implants, which I think is a little bit more. Uh, a little more biologically uh, 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 stable, but uh, but there are also some things which you get concerned about as far as you know as far as uh, uh, you know uh, stress uh, you know that that, that, you're, that you're you're going or removing the stress from the bone and the bone itself just like you see in ankylosing spondylitis it, it gets completely mushy where you have all of really these nice. implants in between where the screws are. So I do worry, you know, this balance between breakage and not, and what it's doing to the bone and what it's doing to the body. But this, you know, you know, for some of the stuff, you're putting a lot of metal into people. And, you know, and as I said, in this case with the, the chromium levels, this lady's chromium levels were absolutely through the roof. So, I mean, there was something that was happening, leaching, occurring, you know, and I think that again, that 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 we don't know. It's funny, Jens, because I think in Europe, you know, the concerns about metal, you know, metal, you know, because I think they because of more arthroplasty that was done there. Their concerns about, uh, you know, metal on metal, you know, stuff is really uh, high and concerning because you know, with metal on metal total hip replacements, there was all sorts of issues that came from them. So I don't know the answer, but you know it certainly is an area of concern. Luis, what are your thoughts on it? Yeah, I had I had to remove a TDR b exactly because of chromium uh, allergic reaction, uh, which is not such a big deal, different from a T4 to the iliac uh, that you will need to revise it. It's crazy, right? Yeah, and I've t I've I've told her I said look at. Uh, you know, I wanted her because to get out, because so many of us have had the experience or we constantly treat and Rod does and Jens does, but people where someone's had continued pain after surgery, they pulled all the implants out and then suddenly the whole thing falls apart through areas of pseudoarthrosis or whatnot. And something and you never can tell till you get in there whether it's solid and sometimes even then you can't tell. And, you know, and I've had things where people have come in with recurrent infections where I pulled the implants out and then six months later, they're, you know, they completely bent like a pretzel. So I'm really worried to pull all of her implants out, you know, and what I was, what I had proposed to her, if I was going to do something and I might, you know, ask, you know, Jens and Rod to comment, I told her, I said, I don't think I'm going to pull your implants out. What I will be willing to do is put all titanium implants in, in place. If this is a chromium allergy, I will put, you know, I will put, uh, you know, titanium screws and then use, you know, maybe commercially pure titanium. The titanium alloys are usually a combination of aluminum, aluminum uh, or, or titanium, aluminum, I think vandium. So it's not chromium. So I would probably use uh, titanium alloy rods and titanium screws. But Jens, what would you do to a patient that came in with, and we'll ask Rod, uh, what would you do if a patient came in who had it? It looks like really does have a chromium allergy. So this is a really big subject because for me, the first differential is not a metal allergy. It's a subclinical opportunistic infection with poorly diagnosed um, uh, pathogens uh, such as, uh, uh, again, staph variants like epidermidis or the PQD um, uh, disease, which is highly under-recognized due to our lab limitations unless we specifically focus on it. 
So that's my first differential. I failed one of my failed studies in Harborview many years ago in the early 90s in doing a metal allergy study where we had an actual federal grant and we put uh, these little pledges on patients and tested all sorts of metals and we could not make sense of the results. And then I find, and this was with allergists at the UW. The end result was many uh, months later with many frustrations and bizarre signals and our results, a allergist told me this is nonsense. Uh, these, create, these are cutaneous reactions and even if they're metal intolerance, it's a different messaging mechanism from what happens in the bloodstream. So the metal ion thing is a real concern and we have established lab panels from the metal on metal uh, uh, concerns where we can measure that. Actual metal allergies, I think, are a very rare uh, event that is probably identifiable with uh, elevated uh, CRPs, but needs to be first and foremost differentiated from the very manageable and treatable uh, occult infection. And that's my personal workup. You know, at least for me, and, and that's a, an outstanding suggestion, if I see implant loosening, you know, and particularly what worries me is that you'll see somebody that, you know, maybe they had a post-op wound infection or not, but if I see a lot of loosening, you know, around screws, the first thought is it, it's some type of infection. And I especially consider that if they have like pe anything peak in them, usually there's this big ring around the peak and I suddenly say, that thing is infected, okay? So for me, if I ever revise those, you know, I send it off and just as you said, Four weeks or six weeks later, inevitably you get a call from the, you know, from your, from your lab saying it's got, you know, propionobacter or it's something else like that that, that, that that grows out. And then the question is at that point, what, you know, what to do, you know, what to do because you've done that. And again, for me, if I have an infection, I generally have a tendency to put titanium implants compared to some of the other implants. Where the issue comes, if you had somebody who's had an a lift, uh, an a lift, and it's got lucency around the a lift. You go back in and pull that a lift out, you know, which I've done before, and again sent that off, and it was definitely infected. And then I put a titanium cage in, which seems to be more resistant to doing that. But you know, I think again, it's a suggestion if you have anybody with these rashes, and particularly with loosening of the implants. And the crazy thing is, is I don't think having a relatively normal CRP or C-reactive protein is absolutely protective either. Because some people have said, oh yeah, well we got a, we got a sed rate and it was, it was 16, mm -hmm. so it couldn't possibly be infection. I think some of these indolent infections can have it despite, what's your experience been with that? Um, so many good points, and it's amazing how we think alike. So following this pathway again, um, I personally uh, think that titanium is far more bio-friendly um, uh, bio than other biomaterials, specifically cobalt chrome. And peak is a biologically problematic substance because it allows for no fibroblast on growth and will remain a true foreign body forever and is also a great biofilm host. So. The natural corrugation of titanium surfaces makes it far more friendly. We still don't know whether there's a titanium leakage issue. Um, uh, that's uh, been looked at for a long time now, for 20 plus years, but we don't have a conclusive answer for that. So basically, um, getting biologic healing is important. And this brings the issue up of what uh, my, my, one of my favorite neologisms, a favorite new term, which is metallusion. So we have this era now, we have so many hardware implants in there that stabilize the spine. Uh, or the uh, pelvic junction that I'm not sure what we're actually dealing with. Whether this is a fusion, clearly not. Whether this is unstable, hard to tell. CT is still the best. But we don't know what really goes on in patients. And so for me, this is a, a very problematic thing. I think being really craftsmanship oriented in terms of getting a good biologic bony fusion and validating that is preferable towards relying on too much metal. I don't know whether that answers your question. Well, no, and I think it's excellent because part of it right now is I tell people that I don't know if four rods is protective. I don't know if that's allowing a fusion to occur, but probably what's allowing is it's going to push that person out past the rest of my career before I have to revise it. That means that maybe you know somebody else like you know Rod who ends up uh, revising this 10 or 15 years down the road because I have now had a patient, I had a patient that, that I revised in this past year that was 15 years after surgery and broke rods. 
Okay, and is really weird. She had she had a she she had a, a bad fall, and it may have broke something loose or something was a stable pseudarthrosis, and she got some motion. Now that lady had only two rods, but it was just very weird. She said she felt this pop, came back to see me, and she was you know 15 years from surgery, and both rods were broken. Maybe she had one rod that was broken and then broke something, but you know, but uh, you know, it it, it certainly. It, just to your point, it's probably not curative. It's more, uh, it's more, you know, protective. And a lot of people have a stable pseudarthrosis. So we must move on. I got the choke sign from Linda. Chris, would you please take the podium? Yes. We want to hear more from you.